and welcome to the Ghosts and Folklore podcast. I'm Mark Rees, and on each episode, I investigate a different, weird, and wonderful subject. And on this episode, it's time for us to hoist the sails and shiver some timbers because we are going on a voyage on board a ghost ship. Yes, we are going to look at the real life story of a ghost ship sailing in Welsh waters. And more than that, we are going to look at a case of a phantom funeral, as it was called, which took place just down the road from where this ghost ship landed. And there is a connection between the two events. This isn't me just chucking two random things together. There is, I believe, a link between the ghost ship and the phantom funeral. And if you pay attention as we go along, maybe you'll pick up on what that connection is before I reveal it at the end. And I don't know if the microphone is going to pick up on this. But I am sitting here recording this in sunny Wales, and the rain is so atrocious outside. I've been waiting for it to calm down, and it won't, and it's just battering my house, and it's the most perfect, ideal weather to be telling a ghost story in. So if you do hear any strange noises during this episode, then while it might be the spirits of pirates or buccaneers trying to communicate with you it might also be the atrocious welsh weather which is soaking my house as i speak now the events of this week's episode all take place in milford haven milford haven in pembrokeshire which is quite famous for its harbor and that makes this town the ideal place i think to talk about a ghost ship In fact, it's so famous, it's one of the few Welsh places that even William Shakespeare included in one of his tales because people headed there to get to the port. Milford Haven, so famous, even Shakespeare included it. And of course, just as prestigious as being name-dropped by William Shakespeare, it did, of course, feature on a previous episode of this podcast where I did promise to include more Milford Haven stories. So here it is, as promised, here it is. Although the reasons are quite different this time, on the last episode to mention Milford Haven, it was because it has something of a reputation as being somewhere where the Welsh fairy folk, the Tulloch Teg, are said to pay a visit to go to market and to generally have a good time. So, when it comes to weird and wonderful phenomena, Milford Haven does indeed have a lot going for it. But we don't want to concern ourselves with the antics of the Tulloch Teg on this episode, because we are looking at the antics of a ghost ship. And we are also going to look, before we get to the ghost ship, to another creepy little story which took place nearby. And that is the tale of a phantom funeral. And they were both recorded by one of the UK's, if not the world's, greatest ghost hunters ever, Mr. Peter Underwood, in the 1970s on his visit to Milford. And he was also quite complimentary about Milford, describing it as perhaps one of the finest natural harbours in the British Isles, and more importantly for us on a podcast about ghosts and folklore, it was once the scene of a phantom funeral. Now, the authenticity of this tale was vouched for by a local man called Mr. John Phillips. And Mr. John Phillips says that in July... 1858. This is a Victorian ghost story or a Victorian phantom funeral that many years previously, seven or eight members of the family of his paternal grandfather were seated at the door of the house one fine summer evening between the hours of eight and nine o'clock. So the scene is set in the 1800s between eight and nine o'clock at night, 
several members of the same family were sat outside and that house was divided from the local church and the local churchyard where people are buried by a brook and some meadows but nevertheless there is a nice clear view from the front of that house towards the church and the churchyard which i imagine on a nice summer's eve was a wonderful view to have outside your house i would love to live with a view of a church outside my house but it was not a lovely view that this family had on that particular night in fact it was quite the opposite and they were amazed we are told to see the arrival of a funeral procession now even back then you don't need me to tell you that funerals didn't really take place between eight and nine o'clock at night nevertheless there it was they could see it with their own eyes they could distinctly see it there was a crowd of mourners and they could see the coffin being held aloft on the shoulders of the men who carried it along the pathway heading towards the church but even though they could see all these people and this coffin and this procession moving they were not quite close enough to the church to make out any discernible faces so while they couldn't recognize this crowd they could certainly see them ambling onwards and as they reached the porch at the front of the church that is when they could pick someone out because they we are told could clearly see the clergyman because they were personally acquainted with the clergyman and he came out of the church dressed in his surplus to meet the mourners and they saw him proceed the procession into the church after which all w w was quiet seemingly they were all inside the church until 15 minutes later it resumed as if it was a normal funeral they all came back out the clergyman and the procession came back out of the church they headed to a particular spot in the churchyard a, a particular spot that yes they were going to bury that coffin in and they gathered around there long enough the the onlookers assumed long enough to listen to the rites being read i mean I'm, I'm assuming they've seen a few funerals in their time and with that it was over it was complete now they weren't just sitting around with their mouths hanging open in in, in shock just waiting for for something to happen they actually decided to investigate and this Mr. John Phillips, who is recounting the tale, says that his grandfather sent somebody over to investigate. And when he spoke to, presumably, the clergyman about why they were burying somebody at such a strange hour, I mean, what, what was going on? It was all a bit eerie. And I really hope that the microphone picked that up. I just had this huge gust of wind blow in my house, as I said, that it really is perfect ghost storytelling weather here in, in in the wilds of wales today but anyway he went to find out and the clergyman or whoever it was he spoke to there simply said that no person had been buried that day nor for several days previously so either he was lying those seven or eight people who witnessed it were having some mass hallucination or there is some other explanation of what was happening that night we are told that and i quote shortly afterwards a neighbor died suddenly and was buried in the exact spot where the ghostly internment had been seen to take place all of which i think confirms that suspicion that they had indeed been sitting there watching a phantom funeral that night which it transpired was simply a premonition of what was due to happen and that is the first of our eerie tales in milford haven but the second one relates to that beautiful harbor as peter underwood described it and and as i would describe it the beautiful harbor of milford haven so underwood tells us has given shelter to phantom ships as well as material ones if you're looking for ghost ships milford haven is the place to go and there is one tale in particular which took place many years ago we are told now this was published in the 1970s so many years before the 1970s and it was somebody who owned a large house on the banks of one of the creeks that constitute the harbor 
was walking home one fine summer's evening, enjoying the moonlight and the evening breeze. Again, a lovely way to set the scene. It's a nice summer's evening, walking along the harbour, back to your nice big house. The breeze is in the air, the moon is in the sky. And there's also another little detail, but a very important detail as far as we are concerned when it comes to setting the scene. And that is on that particular fine moonlit evening, the tide was out. The tide was out so that the creek was deserted. The creek was empty. The creek was dry. And as such, the man thought it was a little bit strange when he heard the the familiar sound, what is an, an unmistakable sound, to a local of a boat coming up the creek. It's a sound, it's a sight he was more than familiar with, but not when the creek was empty. Nevertheless, he heard, and I quote, the measured dip of oars in water and the noise of them revolving in the rowlocks. But nothing was visible. Now, whether or not this man was also aware that Milford Haven was famous for its phantom ships and its ghost boats, I don't know. But if he was hoping to just keep moving on and forget all about it, he had no chance because the volume was turned up. The sound of that boat sailing up the creek increased and then took on a different character. He heard the grind of a keel grating on the gravelly beach by the side of the key wall. And still, nothing was visible. These are sounds this man was more than familiar with, and yet there was no boat. And as a result, he was more than a little alarmed, we are told. A little alarmed at these inexplicable sounds. So he did what any other sensible person would do under the circumstances. He legged it. That puzzled local had no idea what the heck was going on, and he ran away as quickly as his legs would carry him. Well, as quickly as they could get him back home, at least. He was safely back home, through the front door, slammed the door behind him, caught his breath. And upon arriving home, he related the details, the events of what had happened. Uh, it doesn't say to who exactly, his, his wife or his family, whoever was there. But he got home, he told them what had happened. But he also told them of what he had not heard. A nice little detail, I think, this one. It's one we touched upon with um, my friends at Cymru Paranormal, the Welsh paranormal investigators who were talking to me around Halloween time on this podcast and they mentioned about when they investigate some places the spookiest part isn't so much what you hear it's when you hear nothing when there's so much silence not even a bird tweeting that can be more unsettling it's more unnerving than you know having someone screaming their head off maybe just to have that that unnatural silence and this local in Milford Haven noticed when he arrived home that while he could hear these strange sounds of an invisible boat in a creek with no water, there were no other sounds which he would usually hear on his walk home. All the other sounds had disappeared. No seagulls squawking, no footsteps or chit-chat from other fellow walkers, nothing. Nothing but silence and that invisible ghost ship. And that, seemingly, was that. He got home, told his story, the end. Or was it? And as I'm sure you've guessed, no, it wasn't. There is an epilogue. Because a few days afterwards, in that same spot, when that creek was no longer dry and was back in use, a ship docked in Milford Haven. A ship which was part of one of the East India Trading Companies. This does help us with the date slightly, because they, they ceased operating in the late 19th century, so we can assume this story took place in the 19th century, if not earlier. But this boat from India stopped in Milford Haven because it needed repairs. But it did a little bit more than just get repairs while it was in Wales, while it was stationary in Wales, because there was a mate on board that ship who had suddenly died. He died on board. He was put into a coffin. That coffin was brought up from below 
when they landed and it was taken from the ship and onto Welsh soil. And the sound of that coffin being dragged from down below, from under the decks, onto the ground, and the sound that ship made as it docked in Milford Haven were all sounds which were eerily familiar to that man with the big house on the side of the harbour, because he had heard the very same sounds before that boat had docked, before that coffin was brought ashore. He had heard them as he walked home one fine summer evening. And maybe there's something in the water in Milford. Maybe there's some strange powers going around amongst the local residents. Because just like with the Phantom Funeral, while one was on land and the other was on water, or rather wasn't on water because there wasn't any, but should have been on water, in both events, the locals of the town, they had some kind of premonition, some kind of forewarning of what was going to happen in the future, which was revealed to them, to their eyes in the first case, to the years in the second, but they had these ghostly visions and, and heard these ghostly sounds, and not long after, a dead body, a real dead body of some unfortunate soul, would be put in the ground for real soon afterwards. And on that cheerful note, I should remind you that it isn't all doom and gloom in Milford Haven. There is much happiness as well. I touched upon the William Shakespeare link and the Tulluth Tig, the fairies connection. And if you would like to know more about the fairies in Milford Haven, please, by all means, go back and check out episode 25 of this podcast called The Secret Islands of the Fairies for a much jollier, a much happier account of of supernatural activity taking place in that lovely, that mystical spot that is Milford Haven in Pembrokeshire. And as always, if you are lucky enough to live in Milford Haven, maybe, maybe you've been there and seen a ghost ship, maybe you've seen the Tulloth Tig, maybe you've even seen a phantom funeral, it's always lovely to hear from people, even if you just want to say, hello, how is it going? And I'm quite easy to find online. If you just do a search for Mark, Reese, and journalist or author, you will find me on a search engine, or you will find me on social media, on Twitter, on Facebook, or on Instagram. And as always, again, I upload a new episode every Thursday, so to make sure you never miss an episode ever, please consider hitting that subscribe button. And that means every Thursday from now on, you will wake up to some lovely new dose of Welsh folklore sitting there waiting on your on your phone or wherever it is you consume this, this stuff from. And just to give you a quick sneak peek of next week's, we will indeed be venturing back to the realm of the fairies, not necessarily Milford fairies, but we will certainly be going back to catch up with the Tulloth Tig in a week's time. And before I wrap this up, in a little bit of Milford-related folklore, did you know, and why you would know this bit of useless information, I, I don't know, is beyond me, but you might, but did you know that there was an old Milford captain early in the 19th century who was engaged to take ships out for their trial trips. So this captain was employed to just go out on the first trip. Nothing else, no sailing off to the Caribbean or anywhere exotic on some important expedition or anything like that. Just the first trip. And the reason for that is because whatever vessel he boarded, it was, to quote, sure to be lucky. That's not a bad job to have, is it, as a captain of a ship. You are known for being lucky, and you are only put on the first voyages. And I, I, I know very little about boats, but I imagine, like, like with a car, you know, you get a bit of wear and tear with them, and they're more likely to break down when they are, you know, a few years old and you've forgotten to fill up the oil or something, and then they die on you. This man spends his entire life captaining brand new shiny boats. That's not bad work if you could get it. And on that note, it just leaves me to say thank you very much for listening. Dioch and Varian and Grando. 
I've been Mark Rice. This has been my Ghosts and Folklore podcast. And it is, to misquote Dr. Peter Venkman, the best, the beautiful, the only Ghosts and Folklore podcast beaming to you from Wales to the world. And until next time, keep an eye out for any phantom funerals that might be happening near to you. Listen out for any phantom boats that might be docking near you. And keep your wits about you in case those pesky Tulloth Tig make an appearance. No star.